This I recall to mind, that for I hope it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. His compassion fail not. It is new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to him, trust in him, and he will do it. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his predetermined plan. I want to welcome y'all this morning. Um, hope you had a great week weekend. Thank you for joining us uh, for a time of worship and fellowship in the word of God. As God tells us in his word, he that honors me, I honor. And so may the Lord honor you uh, for your commitment to his word and worship in him. All worship is to be done in spirit and in truth. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit desires to teach you this morning, but he cannot teach you if you are out of fellowship, if you have sin in your life that you have not yet confessed unto God, the Holy Spirit is hindered from teaching you. And so we all would like to spend a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity as a believer in Jesus Christ to acknowledge any unconfessed sin. Sin comes in three categories, what we think, what we say, and what we do. So with that being said, in preparation for our worship this morning, Let's spend a few moment of silent prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, to be alive in the land of the living. Some did not have the privilege to be alive to watch you work in human history as you seek to bring lost men to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as you seek to share your happiness with believers through living the spiritual life. And Father, we're so privileged to be alive and we take this time to worship you. And we know that you desire us to be in fellowship when we worship you. So we ask of you to clean us from all sin so that we can be able to fellowship and commune with you and also be able to be taught by our mentor, God, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for those who have set aside time to be here. May you bless them through our worship this morning. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. If you will, you can stand, we'll begin with worship and song.
In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone creator, when my sails are torn, your love surrounds me. In the eyes of the I love that song. You know, God desires to share his happiness with every believer in Jesus Christ. But only a few believers find God's inner happiness because God's happiness is depending on how much we understand about him and how much of his word we have in our souls. Apart from knowing God and knowing God's promises, it is very difficult to experience the happiness of God when circumstance is not always going to be pleasant. You made a wise decision to be here this morning. 
Because apart from God's word, you cannot be happy. A happiness that is not dependent on people and circumstance because people change, circumstance change. But knowing God and knowing his promises and knowing his words stabilize our mentality so that we would not be emotional in a storm or a trial, but we would think through it with God's truth. And so I don't think many believers realize that one of the reasons why we have to continue to retake so many tests in our lives <laughs> is because of our lack of understanding who God is and our lack of understanding the promises of God and our lack of applying what we know to the experiences of life. And so God continued to allow tests in our life to show us our dependence on his word. I don't know about you, I am so thankful that 20 years ago, I made a commitment to make God's word the number one priority in my life. I'm so grateful. I didn't realize the benefit of keeping the main thing the main thing until I was tested and trials came and the Holy Spirit recalled to my mind everything that I had learned from the Bible about him and about his promise and his plan for my life. It gave me hope. And I was able to have calmness of soul and trust God, even in the most difficult circumstance. Not every believer can do that because not every believer make learning God's word a priority. But anyway, that song kind of reminds me of that. If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We have been looking at the 12 obstacles that Abraham encountered in his faith journey. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are on a faith journey. And God is calling you to live by faith. Live by faith as he called Abraham to live by faith. God never planned a journey for us without providing everything that we need to be able to overcome all the obstacles on this faith journey. In other words, he provided us, his, with, with us with his word, which reveal his promises, which reveal his plan for our lives. And so he have already provided everything that we need for our faith journey. He gave Abraham in uh, Genesis 12, verse one through three, his promises. And those promises is how Abraham is going to be able to overcome the obstacles to his first journey. We saw uh, last week that one obstacle he faced to his faith journey, in his faith journey was his wife was barren and in, uh, uh, incapable of producing an heir, as we saw in chapter 11, verse 30. But then we also saw that Abraham was promised a land uh, as an inheritance in verse 7 of chapter 12. But after God gave him the promise, a famine occurred in the land that God had promised him. And so here we saw Abraham backslide because he left the promised land instead of trusting God to take care of him. So he got in his emotion rather than standing on the promises of God. We should never get in our emotion in fear and worry uh, when a crisis happened in our life, but we're to trust God to care for us, knowing that he loved us. And then we saw the, the, uh, the other uh, test uh, to his faith was in verse 11 through 20, Abraham, life was in danger in Egypt. So he lies and say his wife is his sister. Again, Abraham feared, put his wife's life in danger. Uh, but it also, uh, and his wife was actually going to be the promise. Uh, she was going to bear the promised seed 
but he put his wife in danger, life in danger uh, through lying and fear. But then we saw that after uh, God sent a plague on the Egyptian, uh, that the Egyptian made her, made Abraham and his wife to leave Egypt. And now Abraham got to start all over again in his journey to the promised land. And so we see that fear and worry and anxiety hindered his progression to the promised land of what God had for him. Even in our own personal life, fear and anxiety and worry can hinder our progression into the life that God has in store for us. And so his spiritual progression was hindered when he was enslaved to emotion, fear, and worry. However, he returned to the place of blessing in chapter 13. And so I want to start in chapter 13 uh, instead of chapter 12. Let's go to verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and lot with him. Now I want you to, we don't see this here, but what's going to end up happening is uh, when Abraham go up out of Egypt, his wife, he's going to go out with an Egyptian maid as well, which we'll see that Egyptian maid later, uh, Hagar. Uh, and it said, now Abraham was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. Now, this is a fulfillment to, uh, of God's promise. He went on his journey from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I to the place of the altar, which he had made there for formerly. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now here we see he... Um, uh, went back to the house of God after his spiritual failure of fear. You know, this is so encouraging because um, God in his grace uh, always offer forgiveness when we have failed. And here we see Abraham getting back on track after his failure. And the way you get back on track is what Abraham did, come back to the house of God. When you stay away from the house of God, uh, you're guaranteed to have uh, failure in your life. You're guaranteed to fear um, circumstances and worry and feel, be filled with anxiety. And that is failure in the spiritual life. But how do you get back? You confess that sin and you come back to the house of God where you can learn the word of God, which reveal the promises of God. So when Abraham get back to this place at Bethel, He's reminded of the word of God. He's reminded of the promises that God had made him early. And so it is at the house of God that we're always reminded of God's word and God promises so that we can uh, 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 regain ground that we lost when we were living in fear and worry. And now Abraham going to come to another uh, uh, challenge uh, the fourth challenge to his in his faith uh, obstacle in his faith journey. Now let's go to verse five. It say, "Now Lot, who went uh, with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them while the dwelling together, for their possession were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham livestock and the herdsmen of Lot livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite." were dwelling in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the battle of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the Garden of Eden, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you to Zor. So Lot chose for himself the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, now, the circumstance here, now here Abraham is faced with a, a situation here. 
this circumstance of Lot being separated from him uh, is a test or going to call for Abraham to trust God. Why you say that? Because at this particular time, Lot was Abraham's heir. He was his only heir at that particular If Abraham would have died, who would have been his heir? Lot would have been his heir. But now they have separated from one another. So now it called, now Abraham going to have to have faith. He's going to have to trust uh, God right now. Now, when he said goodbye to Lot, it must have been very painful and very difficult uh, because it's almost as though he was saying goodbye to the prospect of the fulfillment of the promise that God had made him of a descendant who's going to inherit what God had promised him. Now, if you look at verse 14 through 17, we see Abraham viewing his inheritance. And we see the path of separation and faith appeared to be lost. So Abraham had to trust God. And, and, and it seemed like he just lost all prospect of uh, an heir of his inheritance. But what we're going to see next is that his faith actually is going to demonstrate that he's going to gain actually more by living by faith. If you look at the next verse, say the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are north and southward and eastward and westward. Now notice Lot got Saddam, but guess what? Abraham got the north, the south, the east, and the westward. So in other words, he gained more than he lost because he chose to take God at his word and trust God. And it was difficult to separate from Lot, but it was called for him to have faith. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendant as the dust of the earth so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendant also can be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through his length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, uh, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So here we see Abraham views his inheritance. He saw that by living by faith, you actually gain more than you lose. His new start of faith uh, at the ferry was the house of God. This is where we all should go. Now let's go to chapter 14. In chapter 14, one through 16, we see another obstacle to Abraham's faith. Another obstacle to Abraham's faith. And what we see here is that Lot is gonna be captured. Abraham is gonna end a war with the kings of the east and he could have died. Lot was captured and Abraham rescued him. And what we see in these verses is Abraham was a man of courage. It take courage to, uh, uh, to go to war. And he was a man of courage, which showed his faith in God. He knew that no one can take my life without God's permission. God has a plan for my life. This man had courage. This is a picture of a true man of God. A real man is a man who have courage, a man who is not saturated with fear. And he rescued Lot. Another thing we see in this chapter as he war with the king is um, his independence of the uh, uh, of the heathen king when when he was uh, the heathen king tried to give him uh, a tenth of the spoil? Abraham said, "No, I'm not going to take any spoil from war from you because then you say I made you rich." Uh, which showed who who was he trusting in to provide for him? He was trusting that God was going to provide for him, and he didn't want anyone to say that they are the one that had provided for him. But we see his faith. We see his faith in rescue and lot. We see his faith in uh, choosing to trust in God to take care of him, which he did not do earlier with the famine that occurred in the land uh, uh, of Canaan, uh, but he resisted. Go to verse 21 of uh, chapter 14. Actually, look at verse 18 of chapter 14. 
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessed of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth all. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God of Most High, possessed of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you would say I have made Abraham rich. So Abraham um, demonstrated his independence. Now he's not being, uh, uh, he is not being, he is not being arrogant, but he's showing that I am dependent on God to care and provide for me. And, 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 uh, and I'm sure the king of Solomon uh, may have been offended by Abraham independence. Now, guess what's going to happen later? Well, uh, the kings of Elam had escaped uh, and might rally his army in the future and come back and uh, attack Abraham. And Abraham contemplated that. And But think about it. The king of uh, Sodom had, had been on his side but by Abraham not all accepting his, his gift or his offering, if the king of Elam decide to come back and fight against Abraham, he's not going to have, have the king of Satan help. And so if Abraham is killed, there would no son to succeed him and his prosperity would fall in the hands of heathens or hands of others. So this required Abraham to trust God. But Abraham battled with, uh, man, me trusting God uh, probably was for no reason at all. Uh, and we know that. How do I know that? That doubt entered Abraham's mind when the king of uh, Elam had escaped uh, uh, and how he contemplated that, man, I just offended uh, the king of Sodom and, and, and if uh, the king of Elam come back, then I'm not going to have no one to help me. And, and, and so doubt creeped in when he was about 85 years old. How do I know that? Because in chapter 15, God appeared to him to calm his fears in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision saying, do not fear. Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. Your reward shall be great. And Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? I don't have an heir. I don't have a child. And the heir of my house, uh, Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. So here we see doubt creeping in. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendant be. And verse six say, and then he believed or took God at his word and he reckoned or accounted it or credited to his account as righteousness. So here we see God calm his doubts and his fears by reassuring him of his promise and told him, no, through your own body, you're going to have a seed. So you have no need to fear. So he's going back. He's, he's, he's tempted to go back to what he came from, uh, uh, where, he, where he failed at in the past. And so that is Abraham's uh, sixth uh, test. And then when we come back uh, next week, we'll uh, look at the six other tests that he uh, endured. Well, actually, let me go ahead and mention it so we can go ahead and go to Isaac next week. The seventh test he faced, um, I actually uh, already mentioned it in verse two and three uh, of chapter 15. Uh, Eleazar appeared to be his heir. OK, that was a test of his faith. And then uh, in chapter 16, 6, go to chapter 16, 6. Here's another test of his faith. 
Where Abraham said to Sarah, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do, do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Now, the, the second test was uh, God had not given Abram a son, and they, they, they wanted to help God by uh, get, uh, getting Abraham. Abraham was impatient when he went into the Egyptian maid, Hagar, and, and had a... Um, um, had a, uh, a child by the name of Ishmael um, through this Egyptian maid. That was impatient. And that was Abram getting ahead a, a of God. Um, and then in chapter 20, we see Amalek threatened Sarah's reputation and her heir. And then chapter uh, 21, verse 8 through, eight through 11, uh, Abram had two heirs, Ishmael and, and Isaac. That's another test of his faith. Chapter 22, God commanded Abram to slay his heir through whom the promised seed would come. That was a test of his faith. And we know the story that he passed um, uh, that um, um, test. In chapter, in the last uh, obstacle to his faith with chapter 24, verse 5, Abram could not find a proper wife for his heir, um, Isaac. He could not find a, a heir. So in closing of Abraham's life, and you can go back and read the story, uh, God called Abraham to live by faith in the crisis and never get your eyes on circumstance, but keep your eyes on the promises that God have made you. God promised to bless the nation through Abraham's seed. Therefore, no matter the adversity, no matter the circumstance, the crisis, keep your mind and your eyes on the promises of God and not the circumstance. That is how Abraham is able to experience the happiness of God, no matter the test. All right, let's start right here. Go ahead. Did you just say that while we have that Sarah Baron, Number two is strike the land. Three is his life was in danger. So he liked that Sarah. Four was strike between Abraham and Lot. Lot was captured and Abraham rescued him in the war. Mm -hmm. What was six? Uh, six were Abraham's uh, life in danger uh, from retaliation uh, in the promised land, meaning the king of Elam uh, threatened his, you know, he escaped. And so his life is, and he, he feared that the king of Elam was going to retaliate. Seven, Eliezer, he thought would be his heir. Mm -hmm. so then the child mm -hmm. is Hagar, so he's mm -hmm. patient. Nine. Uh, 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 um, uh, chapter uh, 20, Amalek threatened Sarah's reputation in her heir. Ten. Abraham had two heirs. Isaac and Ishmael. Yep. All right, so let's stop here. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for our uh, first John um, um, study. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for you preserving your word so that we can understand how to live by faith. We ask that you keep our minds and help us apply these truths. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Sharper than any two of this war, dividing the sun of the soul and spirit and the joints of the marrow, and is a creator of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathe and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished for every good work. The word of God tells us to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and verse 17. You know, 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 is a very uh, tough and challenging um, scripture for me and for all believers, but I want y'all to understand uh, that I don't
pick and choose what I'm going to teach. I teach what I feel motivated to teach. Um, and and, and uh, a few months ago, we started this study of 1 John called Fellowship with God and Intimacy with Christ. And we are all trying to learn how we can have a more intimate, close walk with Christ. And so there's many subjects uh, we're going to come across as we go throughout books of the Bible. And uh, I don't personally um, um, design messages for a particular person. I just teach whatever I'm to teach that Sunday. Sometimes the word of God is going to be very encouraging. And, and actually all the time is encouraged to me, but sometimes it's going to be very challenging as well because it's going to cause for you to be obedient. And, uh, and that's always something difficult. Our old sin nature don't want us to be obedient. And so we, are, we have been talking about prayer. We have been talking about prayer and how we are to pray in love for believers who are going astray. And we, that brought us to the subject of the sin unto death or the sin leading to death. So let's read our text again, verse 16 and 17. And I am going to conclude um, this subject concerning the sin that is leading to death. All right. So verse 16 and 17, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not lead to death, he shall act and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. What we learned previously is that we as Christians should always be concerned about our personal obedience to God. But we are also to be concerned about the obedience of all believers. True love for our brothers and sisters in Christ is when we are concerned about their spiritual well-being. We should not just be concerned about our own personal spiritual well-being, but we should be concerned about all believers' well-being. It is the will of God that every believer experience an abundant life. However, because God give all men freedom to choose for or against him, not all believers experience an abundant life because some believers choose to rebel against the plan of God as God reveals his plan through his word. John, in 1 John 5, 16 and 17, lets us know that our prayers should extend to believers living in rebellion and have hardened their hearts against God. Today, we're going to see what that looks like. Believers who are standing in a way, as a way of life without no desire to restore fellowship with God could face premature death. Remember, every time a believer sins, he is separated from fellowship with God, and this is called temporal death. It is a separation from fellowship with God and the abundant life that God offers through fellowship with him. Only those who are fellowshipping with God can experience an abundant life beyond just having eternal life. The believer is restored to fellowship when he confesses sin and return to God. But some believer, for whatever reason, choose to stay out of fellowship with God harden their hearts against God and knowingly rebel against the plan of God and then they come on a satanic influence. That is the reason for the sin leading to death. Is that believer who come on a satanic influence and rebel against God knowingly. He know that he's rebelled. God's righteousness and justice could allow this believer to experience the ultimate physical consequence of sin. What is the ultimate physical consequence of sin for a believer? It is premature physical death. Now the ultimate consequence for sin of unbelief for an unbeliever is eternal death, the second death. But for a believer, we cannot lose our salvation. So the ultimate 
consequence for sin and rebellion is premature physical death, therefore a loss of rewards when we get to heaven. And we also miss out on blessings and time. This believer has rejected the grace of God for a long period of time. So God allowed a swift death for persisting in certain type of sin or abandonment of himself to perpetual sin. When a believer deliberately, keep that in mind, when a believer deliberately, because I don't want you to associate every believer that die, oh, they just face the sin unto death. No, you know, death is part of living in a sin-cursed world. So not every believer die because of the sin unto death. But most likely a believer who deliberately live in sin, knowing he is rebelling against God, could face premature death. And it will come very swiftly. Sometimes we sin unpremeditated. This is not what John is talking about right here. Look at Leviticus 4, verse 2, speaking about premeditated and unpremeditated sin. Leviticus 4, verse 2. In Leviticus 4, 2, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, if a person sin unintentionally, I sin unintentionally all the time. <laughs> that don't mean that I'm going to face the sin unto death. I sin unknowingly all the time. And the more I grow in God's word, I realize that I am sick. But that is not what John is talking about. Then go to chapter 5, verse uh, 1. Now, if a person sin after he hears, in other words, this is that intentional, deliberately sin. You have heard the word of God, you know what God's will is, and yet you deliberately just go your own way. That could lead to a particular sin that will lead to death. There's a difference. Go to Numbers chapter 15, verse 22. Numbers 15, verse 22. Verse 22, but when you unwillingly fail and do not observe all these commandments where the Lord has spoken to you, even all that the Lord has commanded you through Moses from the day when the Lord gave commandment onward throughout your generation, then it shall be if it is done unintentionally without the knowledge of the congregation. Note it, without knowledge. So John is dealing with knowledge. Those who know the right thing to do but don't do it. Those who deliberately rebel against God, even though they know he will for their life. And then if you look at uh, Numbers uh, 15, verse 30, 15, 30, 15, 30, but the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord and that person shall be cut off from among his people. That's the sin unto death right there. Defiantly. I defy, I defy you, God. I'm going to go my own way. Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> that attitude. I'm going to do what I want to do, even though I know what you want me to do. Look at Numbers 18, verse 22. Numbers 18, verse 22. Verse 22. The sons of Israel should not come near the tent of meeting again, and they will bear sin and die. Because they know what God's will is. And then uh, Isaiah 22, uh, I mean, not, yeah, Isaiah 22, 14. Somebody read, if you will. Isaiah 22, 14, if you get there. I know it's a lot of scripture. If you you can go back to YouTube and and slow it down and get the scripture that I'm going if I'm going too fast. Isaiah 22, 14, go ahead. But the word of the Lord revealed himself to me, 
Truly, this iniquity shall not be forgiven you until you die, says the Lord. So there is a, there's a sin that no matter how much a person prays for you, it is like God said, nope, I'm bringing swift judgment. But we don't know what that sin is, but a believer can contain in sin for so long and defiant and rebellion against God. And it lead to that sin that lead to death. That's why and then we, we are to pray, but our prayer may not help that person because that person have just rejected the grace of God for so long. And there is a certain, there is a sin that can lead that person to die prematurely. And that's why we're, we are to pray. That don't mean that we're not to stop praying. We're to pray for them. But at some point, our prayer might not do any good. God may just call them home. Under the Old Testament law, 613 law, those who abandoned the covenant died physically. Because abandoning God's word is rebellion. And it represents rejecting God and his authority. So when I live in rebellion, guess what I am doing? When I normally know what God's will is, I just go ahead and do what I want to do anyway. That is me telling God, I don't want you, to, I'm... You're not the authority in my life. I'm my own authority. Who added to you think that reminds God of? Satan. That's why God say, at some point, swift judgment will come. It is man establishing his own self as the authority and become his own God, which is also idolatry, which if they do this knowingly, God would judge with premature death. And they lose reward because salvation is by grace through faith. But you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose reward and die premature. Prayer would not help the sin that lead to death, but it will help all other sins. The sin that leads to death is rejection of God completely. It's when the believer reject God completely. This could lead to God not hearing the prayer of redemption for that belief or the prayer of deliverance. There's a point when a person just reject God completely as a believer. God would not even hear prayer for deliverance for that believer. If you, if you want to know how I know that, go to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12 through 20. Ezekiel 14, 12 through 20. Ezekiel 14, 12 through 20. 14, 12 say, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel say, Son of man, if a country sins against me by committing unfaithfulness, and I stretch out my hand against it, destroy its supply of bread, send fam against it, and cut off from it both man and beast. Watch this. Even though these men, three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, by their own writing, they could only deliver themselves, declared the Lord God. If I were to cause wild beasts, not, so notice, no, they can have Noah, Daniel, and Job in their midst praying for them. But guess what? Their prayers are not going to do any good because and, and he's speaking about the, the Judah. See, Judah is about to go into the Babylonian captivity. God had already been patient with them for long periods of time. They knew the law. They knew the will of God. And they deliberately and defiantly rebelled against what they knew. And at some point, God said, guess what? Even if Daniel, Nor, and Joel was in their men, righteous men, even though they got mature believers praying for them, at some point, God chose to not even hear their prayers for those who are rebelling against him because he had been gracious so long. These men being in the midst of Jerusalem would not help Jerusalem. However, believers should pray because we don't know if the sin will lead to death or not. We don't know whether, you know, the sin that believers are committing that we see will lead to death. So we're to pray anyway, because we don't know if that is that sin that leads to death. We're to pray but sometimes, and but don't don't be discouraged if no matter how much you pray, they end up getting taken out because who knows? God probably have been 
patient and gracious to that person for 50 years and they just choose to completely abandon God and never change their attitude toward God. And so don't be discouraged. Sometimes you're, you're, I, I know one thing, your prayer do prolong their life. <laughs> it prolongs their life. But if that, per, that person still has the freedom to choose for or against God. And if, if you, your prayers can prolong their life for so long, that at some point, if they don't change their attitude, then God, as a believer, God will call them home. He will call them home. I know my grandma's prayer prolonged my life. <laughs> but I still had to make a decision at some point. And if I had not made that decision, I think I probably would have faced a sin unto death. But I made a decision, thank God. Thank God he sought me down and made it where I could not get out of the trial that I was in so that I could respond to his grace. We should pray for every believer living in sin as a way of life, but at some point, God will allow premature death and loss of reward, though not loss of salvation. That believer cannot lose his salvation, but he can lose reward and, and, and he can die prematurely. I want you to remember Jeremiah, he went to the people who were so negative toward God's word and look what he said in uh, Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7. Go to Jeremiah 7. I don't want to, I, I, I like the whole chapter, but I don't want to look at the whole chapter. Let me look at a couple of verses. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in the land. God is so gracious. Do not trust in deceptive words saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So that was some who was telling the people what they wanted to hear. Oh, God ain't gonna destroy his temple. But then you had people like, Jeremiah that didn't have a real popular message. God is about to destroy this tip if y'all not there. Repent. They didn't want to hear nothing Jeremiah had to say because, you know, he was just teaching the word of God. They wanted to hear the people that always tell them something to make them feel good. That's what believers who are negative to what God word do. They don't want to come to a church where you're going to teach and give them God. Where they want to go where they got what the pastors are going to tell them what they want to hear. Verse 5. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the aid and the orphan and the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in the place of God. Say, hey, if you turn away from your rebellion to my word and restore your spiritual life, I will allow you to live in this land. So don't listen to the old people that tell you all is good and all is beautiful, nothing gonna happen, but yet you're living in rebellion. Don't listen to the priest, don't listen to Joel, Steve. <laughs> he made you think that yeah, all is well. <laughs> all is well, even though half of the congregation lived in rebellion. Teach the word of God, and boy, it'll make people so uncomfortable. The, the seat starts sweating. <laughs> hey, praise the Lord. I want someone to teach me God's word so that I can be revived and not stay in my sin. Because God wants me to experience an abundant life. Verse 8, behold, you are trusting deceptive word to no avail. Will you still murder and commit adultery and swear false and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk out the other God that you have not known? God's word forbid it. So they are in, they're in rebellion. They have rejected God's authority. But yet you have preachers saying, all is well. And Jeremiah had a whole different message. All is not well. If you repent, it'll be well. But if you don't, get ready to sin unto death. Then verse 12, but go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, declare the Lord, and I spoke to you 
rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called, but you did not answer. Therefore, I would do to the house which is called by my name and which you trust and to the place which I gave you and your father as I did in Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all uh, your brother, the northern kingdom, all the offspring of Ephraim. As for you, do not pray for this people and do not lift the cry or pray for them and do not intercede with me for I do not hear you. So at some point, sometime prayer is not gonna turn God's wrath away because God say over and over and over and over again, I offer you grace, I offer you grace, I offer you grace. I sent my prophets to you, my ministers to you. You do not want to hear. So prayer ain't going to do it. Go to chapter 14, verse, uh, no, chapter 11, verse 14. Chapter 11, verse 14. Therefore, do not pray for these people, nor lift up a cry of prayer for them. For I would not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. Go to chapter, uh, what else is it? 14, 11 now, 14, 11. Jeremiah 14, 11. So the Lord said to me, do not pray for the welfare of these people when they fast. I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I would not accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end of them by the sword, famine, pestilence, sin unto them. So John warning is again sin and the failure to maintain faith. He showed that while he expected his reader to walk in the light as sons of God, he did not ignore the possibility that some believe in, but they have become apostate. They have abandoned God. They have abandoned their faith knowingly in rebellion. Many Christians don't realize that continuing sin lead to some form of death or separation. First, it leads to loss of fellowship with God, which is temporary death. And then second, if that believer normally continue to rebel and lead to premature physical death, we all are going to die physically as a result of Adam's sin as part of the fall unless the rapture happened first. But we can die prematurely and God will bring us home for disgracing him down here. And that's what believers in rebellion do. They disgrace God. They bring shame to his name. God has done this throughout the Bible we see. He is not the reason for death. We are the reason in our rebellion. Adam is the reason for death in his rebellion. God is not the reason. But people like to make excuses or look for somebody to blame because what? They want to continue in their rebellion against God. Their attitude to, toward God's word have not changed. So they'll try to blame God. Oh, he's not a loving God if he will allow this to happen. But that is... Just an excuse. God is not the reason for death. Rebellion is. Adam rebelled, and therefore he brought physical death on all of us. So death is not God. It is it, of, 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 because of rebellion, sin. I want to give you just a couple more examples. I'm going to give you some example in the last 10 minutes of the sin unto death in the Old Testament, and I'm going to get off the subject of sin unto death. Another example in Acts 5. Verse 1 through 10, we have Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they face the sin unto death. Acts chapter five, uh, 5. Go to Acts 5, if you will. Verse 1, but a man named Ananias and with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the piece for himself. With his wife full knowledge and bring a portion of it, he laid it at the apostle feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have saved fear your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. Sin unto death. So here we see that uh, money, uh, 
uh, Ananiah and Sapphira, what they did was they allowed money to distract them from the plan of God. Um, they were obsessed with money. Money is not ruining itself, but money is, can cause us to be obsessed to the point where it lead us into a whole life, a lot of other sin. It's not self in itself. We are the word, we're to say it's okay to spend. It is God's provision. However, when we magnify money out of proportion, where it distracts from the plan of God, it is a problem. And we see that in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 14, and also James chapter 5, 1 through 6. Because these individuals had a delusion regarding money. money. What was their delusion regarding money? One, money brings a means to happiness. They thought that money can bring them happy, happiness. Don't you know when we have that attitude, we are rejecting God and his plan. When we think money will bring us happiness, that is a rejection of God. Why you say that? Because only God can bring us happiness. Only pursuing his plan for our life can bring us happiness. So thinking money uh, can bring us happiness is, is a rejection of God. Two, they were disillusioned with money brings security. That's a rejection of God. That uh, 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 instead of, tr no, trusting in God brings security. Money can buy anything. That's rejection of God because only pursuing God's plan brings happiness. Money can't buy happiness. But when we have that attitude that it can, then that's a rejection of God in our attitude. No, pursuing his plan, trusting him, gives us inner happiness and gives us inner peace. Apart from God and his word, filling our minds and our perspective, there is only one life that we were experiencing, and that is a life of emptiness. I tried it. I've been there. Solomon been there. And we actually lose true happiness when we reject God, regardless of our status, regardless of our education, regardless of our accomplishment, regardless of our success or how much money we get. We lose God's happiness when we think that money can buy anything, including happiness. We actually lose happiness. How many people have that mindset and they're not happy? In Matthew 6, verse 24 to 33, here's our security. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. That's our security. Trust in God. If I am putting God first, he's going to take care of everything. He's going to give me everything. That is my soul. I'm secure. I don't have no reason to be afraid and panic. I don't care about the stock market. I don't care about the real estate crash, a market crashing. Guess what? If I keep God first, he got it all under control. That's my security. No amount of money can purchase salvation, peace, stability, spiritual, and love. Only faith and obedience in God can do that. We have five minutes. Another example of the sin unto death. Go to 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Another example of the sin unto death. Incest in the Corinthian church. Incest in the Corinthian church. By the way, after 1 John, we're about to get into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I really want to look at this right here. Look at verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist, even among the Gentile, that someone had his father's wife. So there was a believer in the local church that will have an intercourse with his father's wife. That's incest. Now that could lead to the sin of the dead. Look what Paul is saying in verse two. And, and people in the church knew about it. And they wasn't saying anything about it. You have become arrogant, have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed will be removed from your midst. Church discipline. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in the spirit, have already judged or decided decided him who has so committed this as though I was present. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are assembling, and I with you in the spirit, with the power of our Lord, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for what? The destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Notice 
Paul is saying, discipline that believer. Put him out of the church, out there in Satan's domain. And what's going to happen? He's going to die physically. But he's not going to lose his salvation. He's going to die physically if he uh, continue in that sin. But he will not lose his salvation. That's another example. Uh, let's see. Another example to sin into death is 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 31. You don't necessarily have to go there. When believer was coming to communion in sin and not respecting the communion service and they were observing communion with unconfessed sins. A fourth example to sin condemned, sin unto death, King Saul refused to fight and kill King Agag as God had told him to. And he continued over and over again to rebel against God and God took him out. And then five, fifth example, first uh, Timothy 1, 19 through uh, 20, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, they were troublemakers in the local church. They gave into the sin of the tongues. They were causing problems within the, the local church through, with their mouth. Probably gossiping, lying, slander, discord, habitual living in the sin of the tongue, and which will lead also into the sin unto death. For God hates division. Another example of the sin unto death is uh, Isaiah 30, one through three. I got to go to Isaiah 30, one through three, and I might have, I'm going to stop with that one. That'll be the last one. Go to Isaiah 30, one through three, anti-establishment reversionism, anti-establishment reversionism. In other words, rejection of God's authority by a nation. Go to Isaiah 30, one through three. Here's another example, Isaiah 30, one through three. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. For their princes are at Zoan and their ambassador arrive at Hennes. Everyone will be ashamed because of a people who cannot profit them, who are not for help or profit, but for shame and also for reproach. The oracle concerning the beasts of the Negev, but then go down to verse eight. Now go, write it on a tablet before them and try in a stroll that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. For this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord. Let me summarize the, the remainder of this chapter. God had commanded Judah and her kings in Exodus 13, verse 17, to never return to Egypt, but to trust him. But instead of trusting God to help them against the Assyrians, they were rebellious and they went down to Egypt to form an alliance with Pharaoh. They wanted his help against the Assyrians. When God told them, never go back to Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. Do not go back to Egypt. But they went anyway. They formed an alliance with Egypt in fear of the Assyrians. And God told them, do not go there. They went anyway. Rebellion is rejecting, and they were so they were rejecting God's authority. They were going their own way. Many believers today, they think that they can find life rebelling against God's plan, but it leads to premature death. A believer in rebellion do not consult God's word for direction. As he said here, woe to rebellion church, declare love, who executed a plan, but not mine, and make a lion, but not by my spirit. They don't seek direction from God, but it's so they go their own way. When we don't seek direction for God or seek God's help, we go our own way. And so the Israelites sought the shadow of Pharaoh instead of what Psalm 91.1 say, I will hide behind the shadow of the Almighty. Their heart will harden at that point. 
When we try to find satisfaction going our own way, we will be disappointed and shamed as God told the rebellion, the rebellious Judaites in Isaiah 31 through three. God punished meant for rebellion. We see in verse eight through uh, 17, we are to pray for sin and believers so God can give life to them who are committing sin, not leading to death. But remember, there is a sin that it punishable by death. All right, let me get off that subject. And now I just want to give you the solution for the sin unto death. How does the Christian who is rebelling against God, living in defiance of God, recover so that he would not experience the sin unto death? Here's how. One, our prayers. We're to pray for them. Our prayer prolonged their life. Two, he is to change his mind and attitude about God and his word. Three, confess his rebellion. Four, listen to and apply God's word in obedience. And then he's on the road to maturity. And he now have recovered. A defiant attitude toward God's word and insult of nation to Jesus lead to the sin unto death. Resisting God's authority through rebellion lead to seeking to overthrow divine authority. All believers that resist God's authority, they resist authority in marriage. They resist authority in a local church. They resist authority in a local government. They resist authority uh, in a nation. A believer in rebellion resists all, all forms of authority because they are in rebellion. And the reason they resist all forms of authority because they're rebelling against God, the creator, of all and, and the one who established all authority. So we'll start right here. And, and I just want to encourage you, if you know any believer who have lost sensitivity and seek not to restore fellowship with God, but deliberately pursue sin and don't see anything wrong with it and have no desire to turn from it, that person is on his way to the sin of the dead. And let us pray so that God may prolong their life. I promise you, next week, we won't be talking about the sin unto death. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for your grace and your love. You're not the reason for that, but you are the solution. And thank you, Father, for the love that we have for one another, that we could pray for each other and believers who may be uh, in uh, um, uh, living in rebellion, but we are to love them so that you may prolong their life through prayer. We ask for you to be merciful to every believer um, that it have turned their back in rebellion knowingly against you. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.